Uh, first, we have um, Major Tom Fleener speak on military commissions. He's a major in the Army Reserves, uh, former federal public defender in Wyoming, and he currently def uh, was mobilized to defend you know, Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay military commissions. Uh, then we're going to have Professor Morris talk on Hamdan case. Uh, Professor Morris, Professor Law at Duke University, director of the Duke Geneva Institute in Transnational Law. Not anymore. Former. Uh, <laughs> she, she's been published widely in the fields of international criminal law and international humanitarian law. And she served as senior legal counsel, office of the prosecutor, special court for Sierra Leone, and consultant to the US Department, advisor on justice to the president of Rwanda, and a lot more. Um, later we're gonna have uh, then Lieutenant Commander Bill Keebler is gonna speak about the Cotter case. Uh, he's a Lieutenant Commander in the Navy JAG Corps, full time, and former in the private sector, also former prosecutor. And then I'm gonna finish up talking about Hicks, David Hicks, and then we're gonna have a discussion so you can ask questions. Uh, Major Tom. Hey guys, uh, my name's Tom Fleener, and uh, I appreciate being able to give the opportunity to come down and talk to you guys for a while. Um, and I, I appreciate also, uh, greatly appreciate Madeline Morris and the, and the Duke Law, School, Law students uh, putting together a clinic for the last two years to help us out. It's been a, you guys are an under, unbelievable resource and we, we really appreciate it. So on behalf of the Office of Military Commissions, we certainly appreciate it, Office of the Chief Defense Counsel. Um, I'm one of the defense attorneys that's uh, been assigned to, to represent down in Guantanamo Bay. And I, I'm going to give a brief oversight, I guess, on the military commission structure and process. And we're only here for an hour. So uh, I'm going to try to be really, really brief and real, real vague. If you guys have any more specific questions after everyone gives their little spiel, please don't hesitate to ask. There have been some, some uh, interesting uh, happenings, I guess, in the last couple days, and, there, and it's going to pick up again in the next few months. So a lot of what we can talk about will be uh, more recent uh, and, and looking into the future rather than the past, but it's certainly important to understand, I guess, where we, how, where we were and how we got to where we are. Uh, military commissions are a special military tribunal that have been used uh, off and on throughout our nation's history. Uh, the, the, um, they were used certainly in, in, uh, in, in World War II. They were used uh, in the Civil War. There were some types of, 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 of tribunals that have been used in the, the Mexican-American War, in, the, uh, in the, the Revolutionary War, depending on who you talk to, of, uh, whether, uh, about whether or, not, whether or not a certain trial was a, was, would be considered a, a military commission. Um, but essentially, there were a special trial that's you, that were used in certain circumstances to try people when certain uh, conditions existed, primarily when you're in, in places where there was no civil law operating um, and there needed to be people tried for crimes with, they had to create a, a justice system in order to try those folks. Occupation courts, if we we're down in Mexico, for instance, where there wasn't any civil, uh, civil there were no civil authorities in Mexico to, to, hear, to hear, um, hear cases, they, the commander of the military unit that was down there would create his own little military court to try both sometimes military people, sometimes civilian people, uh, before these, these tribunals. But they were very, very limited in jurisdiction and not used, widely used, for pretty obvious reasons. All the rules were being made up. Essentially, there were ad hoc tribunals and um, they, they were just it was certainly the, the rare exception rather than the norm, which is why we didn't have any sense since World War II. After 9-11, the president decided he was going to bring military commissions back into the fold, and he used what was uh, the same sort of military commission order that they used in World War II, and they had several commissions in World War II, to create this military tribunal system, which is kind of like a military court-martial um, in that you have all the players are military players primarily, but the crimes are different, the rules of procedure and evidence are certainly different, and at the end of the day, essentially what you have is a, a tribunal, a, a, a trial process that doesn't really resemble much of anything that anybody that is 
been around and there haven't been one in 60 years is used to seeing. They started these, these tribunals. The president issued a military order and was, they were going to bring a few of the Guantanamo Bay detainees to, uh, to be tried by this military order. The, uh, the military order then ha gave the power to the Secretary of Defense, then uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, to create a bunch of rules. And he drafted a bunch of rules, he and his lawyers, uh, and charged originally four people, four detainees, to be tried before these military commissions. The four detainees were uh, a guy named Al Kosi from, I think, from yeah, Saudi Arabia. Um, my particular uh, <coughs> client or non-client, I don't really represent him, but the guy I've been assigned to represent, a guy named Ali Hamza al Batlul of Yemen, another, an Australian named David Hicks, and Salim Hamdan, the, the bodyguard and Osama, Osama bin Laden's driver, uh, alleged driver. Um, those are the four who were originally scheduled to be tried. In 2004, no, August through November of 2004, they had a few initial proceedings. They were a disgusting mess because the rules were all being made up as you go. None of the lawyers really knew what was going on. The judges certainly didn't know what was going on. Um, and thank goodness the, uh, the military attorneys had by that time had reached out and, and grabbed some civilian attorneys as well and got them involved in the process. And what happened was that the trials all stopped in November of 2004 because Salim Hamdan, Charlie Swift, his lawyer, reached out, grabbed Neil Kachel from Georgetown, and they started through the federal court process and got a, and end up ultimately getting a stay at the district court level in D.C. Uh, David Hicks, same process. He reached out to civilian law firms and he got a stay. Some of the other the other lawyers, or excuse me, the other detainees did not because they, they refused to be represented by counsel. But having the original detainees get, a, get stays in their military commissions by federal courts was rather unprecedented because the administration believed at that time that there was no jurisdiction for any judge to hear these, to, to involve itself in military commissions, certainly. The commission stayed in a stay status all the way until January, January of 2006, where the commission, the, they revamped the commission rules, made them different, some a little bit better, and brought in new lawyers and some new players and charged 10 people before the military commissions. Uh, I, was brought, I was brought on, so was Lieutenant Commander Keebler. We both uh, uh, were assigned to represent detainees before this military commissions 2.0 uh, system that was going on for about five or six months in Guantanamo. And we had several hearings down in Guantanamo in the spring of last year of 06. Um, none of them, all of them procedural, none of them substantive, most of them dealing with who the lawyers are going to be and what the rules are going to be. And they all stopped when Hamdan came out in July of 2006 saying the military commissions uh, haven't been blessed by Congress, they're terrible, please stop this. And Everybody stopped doing everything, and we all just sort of sat around and wrote and talked and played until November of this last year when Congress passed the Military Commissions Act. When Congress passed the Military Commissions Act, it codified, essentially did what the Supreme Court and Hamdan may have asked it to do, which was codify a military commissions process. And in January of this year, the administration drafted new rules for military commissions which are make it look a little bit more like a tr uh, regular trial, but still not even really close. Um, and have then, uh, they started up three cases. The Hamdan case, the Hicks case, and a case uh, involving Omar Khadr, who is a Canadian who was taken into custody when he was 15 years old in Afghanistan. Um, those are the three cases that were scheduled to start before the military commissions. The first case that ultimately started was David Hicks's military commission, which began on Monday, two days ago, and resulted in a rather fascinating and unprecedented guilty plea um, at the arraignment early on. And we'll talk about that in, in, in detail uh, later on. But that's the real, uh, in a nutshell, where we are as far as military commissions go. They've been tried, the administration tried twice to do them solely through the executive powers. The court stopped them finally in Hamdan and said Congress has to authorize it. Congress, uh, in election year politics, created the Military Commissions Act. 
and now we are in a military commission system blessed by Congress. Still many, many legal questions are floating around out there that ultimately has to be decided, but they probably won't be decided by the David Hicks case because he just pled guilty. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to uh, Professor Morris. Madeline will discuss uh, a little bit about the Hamdan litigation, I think. I'll do that. Uh, first, though, I wanted to um, express our gratitude to the Office of the Chief Defense Counsel and in particular to Commander Keebler and Major Tom Fleener um, for integrating the clinic to the extent that they have into the work of the Defense Counsel's Office. It's been quite an extraordinary experience, certainly for me, and I think for the students that have been involved. The other person that, um, well, and I should mention also that Ma Major Fleener, who said something about his client non-client, has the distinction of having a client who isn't a defendant. Um, he's been a defendant twice. He's been a, yeah. It's, but not anymore. Um, and wants to go pro se if he ever is recharged. So I, I think that um, Major Fleener is the purported defense counsel in the future, perhaps, of a former defendant. But possible future defendant. And possible future defendant. Correct. Thank you. It's hard to figure out. <laughs> the, and as is the military commissions, they uh, constantly evolve and change. Also wanted to in, uh, introduce Landon Zimmer, who is, as you know, a student here, and who is the case manager within the clinic for the Hicks team, uh, the team that's working with Dan Morey, Morey, the lead defense counsel for Not anymore. Dan Hicks. Well, yeah, he still is. Well, I mean. A little bit. Um, and also, is it, who else is here from the Hicks team? Good job, guys. Uh, or former Not Hicks team. Uh, All right. At first, I thought for um, David Hicks and for Dan Morey, his, his lawyer, and um, the people on the team, that the Hicks team that have been working um, this semester and for many semesters on that case, that uh, maybe this was a terrible thing, this guilty plea. Um, but as we get on to talking about um, the guilty plea in particular, um, I'll, I'll raise some, some questions about that. You know, guilty pleas are complicated things, and here as well, I think. Um, so we can talk about that when we talk about Hicks. As to Hamdan, as you know, or very, very probably know, last June, the Supreme Court, as Major Fleener mentioned, overturned the initial establishment of military commissions that um, had been structured by the president without congressional um, participation or certainly legislation. And then over the course of the following five months or so, the Military Commissions Act, MCA, um, was negotiated and eventually passed by Congress, um, during which time, of course, there were no defendants that had charges um, since there, were, there was no uh, legal basis, there was no anything under which to charge them. There, there was no document. Um, the, there was no military commission, but yet there were these kind of sort of detainees slash were and maybe future defendants. And interestingly, during that period, defense counsel were instructed to kind of think of themselves still as defense counsel, and the Office of the Chief Defense Counsel remained in existence. Um, the, then the clinic during that time, um, fortunately for us, and I hope uh, of some assistance, participated in what was happening um, at that period, which was negotiating and attempting to have some influence on the MCA that would uh, inevitably be enacted, um, with some discussion of whether it was better to try to improve it um, or do what we viewed would be improvements uh, and try to get those through, or at some point, to um, leave the issues in there. If the, the, the more unconstitutional we thought something was, or, you know, the, the, um, the question with commissions very much in all, in very different contexts is, do you try to make it work as well as possible, or does that just legitimize and make things easier um, and take away issues for appeal, and all, all of that is, is very much at issue 
um, in all of the cases, and sometimes uh, in things like legislative involvement. So now Hamdan has been recharged, is one of the three who have been recharged under the Military Commissions Act. He's charged with conspiracy to murder in violation of the law of war, and he's charged with material support of terrorism. Um, there are about three problems with those two charges, in my opinion. Um, there's no conspiracy law that would apply. There's no such crime as murder in violation of the law of war. And the material support statute that they may point to um, is not applicable um, in, in the jurisdiction in question. Uh, other than that, that's, that's the, uh, those will be the proceedings on, on those bases. In Hamdan right now, um, motions are being written. The expectation is that Hamdan will be arraigned shortly. And the um, clinic students are, are writing several motions uh, to be prepared for that date, which we don't have it in specificity, but I expect, as I've said, to be quite soon. Uh, and we'll then have, we'll have sort of a plenary meeting in Washington on the, well, in a couple of weeks, um, where civilian counsel for Hamdan will come in, Clinic students in the Hamden team will, will come in um, and will review the motions and have them ready for what we expect will then be a pretty um, imminent arraignment. That's it? That's it. That's all. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am uh, Lieutenant Commander Bill Keebler. I'm with the Office of Military Commissions. I want to start by uh, echoing Tom's expression of gratitude to uh, Professor Morris and to Duke, uh, uh, Duke Law School for uh, not only hosting us today, but again, providing the support uh, to our office that they've provided over the last year and a half. It really has been invaluable. And um, uh, it's, I think, the highest privilege of working in this office to be able to come down and uh, engage with the students here um, on these very important issues, and, and we're grateful. Um, as uh, Landon mentioned, I am the detailed or one of the detailed military counsel in the uh, case of Omar Khadr. Omar is a 20-year-old Canadian uh, citizen by birth who um, was taken into custody at the age of 15 after a firefight in coast Afghanistan uh, in which he was actually shot twice by uh, American forces. Um, in the course of that firefight, he allegedly uh, threw a hand grenade uh, that killed an American soldier. And uh, he's been detained in Guantanamo Bay since uh, he was 15 uh, as a so-called enemy combatant. Uh, he was one of the 10 that was charged in um, Military Commissions 2.0, as uh, Major Flynn referred to it during his remarks. Um, and he is one of the first three to be recharged under the uh, new Military Commissions Act. Uh, he's charged with five offenses, um, attempted or murder in violation of the law of war, um, uh, attempted murder in violation of the law of war, spying, conspiracy to uh, commit various war crimes, and um, uh, material support to terrorism. And as Professor Moore suggested during her comments, there are a number of potential legal problems with uh, most, if not all, of those charges, and that, that's certainly going to be a... a a centerpiece of our uh, defense of, of Omar. Uh, beyond that, there are some, some interesting uh, case-specific issues um, with respect to Omar, uh, one of which, you know, obviously given his age uh, at the time that he was taken into U.S. custody, there are certain issues that arise um, uh, in connection with his, his you know, status as a, a child in connection with armed conflict, a child soldier, arguably. Um, International law on that subject, is, as I've come to understand it uh, over the last month or so that I've been assigned to the case, um, requires, among other things, age-appropriate treatment. Um, and Omar has certainly never received any age-appropriate treatment. He's been treated uh, in the same way as every other enemy combatant at Guantanamo has, it, I, I should, with one exception. The only time that he's ever been um, you know, treated uh, appropriate to or received age-specific treatment was when the government, in the course of interrogations, threatened him, uh, threatened to render him to a third country where he might be uh, raped by older men because of his age. So that, they did, uh, you know, acknowledge his age at one point in the course of his detention at Guantanamo Bay, but unfortunately not in the way that the law requires. Um, beyond the, the child soldier issues and the age-specific issues, you have some uh, issues that are common, I think, to the other detainees concerning um, uh, POW status and combatant immunity. Uh, 
it's not, you know, we can talk about this maybe more if we have questions, but it's, it's not a war crime to engage in, arm, you know, in combat in the course of a war. Uh, it may be a crime under the domestic law of the, of the state in which the conflict takes place. It may be, you know, depending upon the conduct, it may be a violation of other, other laws, but it's certainly not a war crime. And, of course, part of the problem here is that in order to justify these extraordinary procedures, the administration has dressed these things up as war crimes and calls them war crimes. And it's, it's important at the outset, I think, to, to acknowledge and understand that we're not talking about real war crimes here. So you have somebody that is engaging in, in a firefight in the course of an armed conflict. Uh, international law, we think, is fairly clear that that person is, is presumptively entitled to POW status under the uh, Third Geneva Convention, which, among other things, requires him to be treated in certain ways that would be inconsistent with the way that he has treated, has been treated, an example being the, the interrogation methods that I referred to a moment ago. Uh, and also, POWs uh, under the Third Geneva Convention cannot be tried by special tribunals. Uh, they have to be tried, if they're going to be tried for war crimes or other acts of belligerency, they have to be tried by the same process that the detaining power would use on its own soldiers. So in Omar's case, it would mean that if he has actually done anything uh, illegal, he would have to be tried by a court-martial. And that's the rule under the Third Geneva Convention. Uh, there is something under the Third Geneva Convention, it's called Article 5, which is a provision that uh, uh, you know, allows for somebody to be determined to have something other than POW status, which would potentially open up these avenues for, for, for special treatment. Um, but the administration, as a, as a blanket rule in the, in the war on terror, has said we're not going to comply with Article 5. We're going to consider al Qaeda and the Taliban to be uh, entities that, that you know, for various reasons, are not entitled to protection of the Geneva Conventions. And so because the president says so, uh, Omar is an enemy combatant, not a, PNW, not a POW, and he's not entitled to any of those protections. So those are, I think, two predominant themes in, in Omar's case. Um, going forward, you know, certainly those issues are going to be worked out in litigation. Another important piece of this, because of the inherently political nature of this process, is, and I think history over the last five years has shown this, that one's treatment in Gitmo is a function of one's um, uh, citizenship or, you know, or, or nationality. Uh, if you're British, you leave. If you're Australian, you get to have certain privileges that maybe you don't get to have otherwise. Uh, and that's a function of, the, of, I think, the pressure that these governments have put on the United States and that their own publics have put on, on, their, on those governments. Canada has been uh, virtually so absent. Uh, and has certainly been silent on the issue of Guantanamo and on the issue of, of Omar's treatment. Uh, it's amazing, but I mean, it, it is one of the few countries, uh, I, don't, I don't know the right way to say it, but, you know, allied countries, NATO countries, European countries, um, that have not come out and ever publicly condemned Guantanamo Bay. I mean, it's just, it's very interesting. So you have a Canadian citizen who's being held, who's being uh, subjected to this treatment, um, who's being uh, subjected to a trial process that no you know, that the United States has decided is not good enough for an American, and the Canadian government and Canadian people sort of sit by and uh, sit there and watch. And I think one of the reasons for that, Omar's family, um, and this is, you know, a central part of Omar's case, if, you know, if you want to look at his charge sheet, it's on the Internet, and, and the government sort of, um, I think, highlights this theme itself. Uh, you know, he comes from a family that's alleged to have extensive ties to al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, particularly his father. Um, his, his family has made a number of unfortunate comments in the media about, um, about those issues. And so, I, you know, Omar is not, um, you know, he, he is... He's not being treated, I think, the same way he would be treated if, if, frankly, he was a white Canadian. It's because he comes from this uh, Muslim family that's, that's, made these, that's made these comments that maybe the Canadian public is not giving him the same support that they would give someone else. And, and you know, I don't know if that's true or not. It's certainly a hypothesis. Um, but, it's, it's, again, it's unfortunate that Canada would sit by while one of its citizens is treated this way, and it's, it's hard to figure out what other explanations there might be. Uh, and if it is the case, and I think it's something that people in Canada have to seriously ask themselves why they, uh, why are they making that distinction. Uh, as far as the uh, litigation Omar's case is concerned, he was a party to the uh, Boumedien uh, case that was decided by the D.C. Circuit a few weeks ago, which um, uh, upheld the jurisdiction stripping provisions of the uh, Military Commissions Act. Um, he, like sorry? Habeas jurisdiction. Well, I mean, it's broader than that. But yeah, I guess Boumedien was limited to habeas. Um, Omar has not, he's actually broken off of that litigation, though. He has not, but 
the uh, the Boumediene petitioners have filed petitions for, for certiorari in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Hamdan, did, you didn't talk about this. The Hamdan, <laughs> Hamdan is um, rather important. Yeah, Hamdan, you know, after the MCA, Hamdan filed a motion in the district court in front of Judge Robertson, uh, their district court judge. Uh, or I shouldn't say Hamdan filed a motion. The government uh, moved to dismiss Hamdan's petition in light of the MCA. Judge Robertson dismissed the petition. Uh, rather than appealing that decision of the D.C. Circuit, what, what Hamdan has done is filed what's called a petition for uh, certiorari before judgment with the Supreme Court, which, an, which is an extraordinary procedure that can be you know, employed by the court to hear a case without um, the, the, the Court of Appeals having the opportunity to, uh, uh, to review the decision. So what we have done in uh, Omar's case is we've actually broken from the Bumidian petitioners and we've joined as a, um, uh, a co-petitioner in, um, in the Hamdan case. And so that, that petition is, is pending before the court now. Uh, there was a motion for expedited consideration that was filed, which the court has denied. Doesn't mean they're not going to hear the case, just means they're not going to expedite the, the decision to, you know, uh, to grant cert. So we're hopeful the court will grant uh, grant review, and that'll be heard, if not this term, which is probably unrealistic at this point, then, uh, then the next term. Um, and that's where we stand in, in Omar's case. Thank you. And, uh, I guess I'll talk some about David Hicks. As you saw, he pled uh, earlier this week to uh, material support for terrorist organization. He's uh, David Hicks, 31-year-old, former kangaroo skinner in Australia. He a uh, former cowboy, and he left. He left Australia uh, allegedly on a jihadist movement, and was captured in Afghanistan late 2001. Uh, he was one of the first people brought to Gitmo, and uh, when it opened, and he's been there pretty much the whole, entire time. Uh, additionally, he was tried before a military commission when he got there, but that was stopped once the Hamdan litigation began, and once that ended up, he was brought back. Uh, recently, and that's when he pled guilty to material support. Um, I guess you want to open it up to questions now to about Hicks specifically, or maybe there... we should tell a little bit more about Monday in particular. If you want to elaborate, or if Tom yeah. wants to Tom, elaborate, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. On uh, on Monday, what was what was fairly interesting about the uh, the Hicks case is David Hicks was the first person to be tried. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. David Hicks was. The, first person to be tried before the new military commissions uh, created by Congress. Um, I, I mean, and when we say he was brought back to the commissions, I mean, Guantanamo Bay, everything is still in Guantanamo Bay. The little trial courthouse looking thing is in Guantanamo Bay. It's not next to the prisons, but it's in the same little tiny part of the island. Um, so when, when someone when is brought back before the military commissions, they're actually just put in a truck and driven to the make-believe courthouse where they have the, the hearings and then taken back to their cell. Um, but that's how the Guantanamo Bay uh, commissions of the trial process, process works. Dan Morey had filed a motion uh, alleging prosecutorial misconduct against the, um, the prosecutor in this case, uh, uh, Colonel Mo Davis, the chief prosecutor for the military commissions and a, a, a colonel from the Air Force. Uh, Dan Morey had been in Australia, and I know there's uh, uh, how many people follow the Australian press, but Dan had been fairly vocal in Australia and actually done a very, very good job, wonderful job, in sort of turning the Australian uh, public against the, um, the military commissions and the Bush administration, a lot of the war on terror stuff. I mean, Dan really has done a great job over there, and he's been a, a, a rather vocal um, He's been a thorn in the thorn in the side for the United States government over there, and he's been doing it under the under the uh, I use the word guys, and I don't want to make it sound like it is a guise, but he's been u doing it with the authority of the United States because he's doing it in a representational capacity, doing everything he can to represent his client. Well, eventually, apparently, the 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 prosecutor thought it was a little too good. Um, because and he actually said so in an email that Dan's been very effective in turning the Australians against their own government. So he alleged that Dan had committed a violation of 10 U.S.C. 888, which is uh, essentially uh, prohibits military folks from saying bad things about the President, Congress, and Secretary of Defense. It's, um, it's a charge you never see. Uh, it's in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I mean, I've been a defense attorney for 
eight years, I guess, seven years defending soldiers. I'd never, I never defended any of those cases or any of those charges. Um, and, and there's a big question as to whether or not saying bad things about the administration in your representational capacity as an attorney licensed by a state who's given you the charge to do everything that's everything within your power to represent your client to the best of your ability, whether or not you're given some sort of de facto immunity from saying bad things about the administration, uh, one, when they're true, and two, that are to the best interest of your client. The truth is doesn't matter, but certainly uh, number two would be relevant. And there really isn't any, there's been no discussion on that concept as to whether or not a lawyer who has who, who believes it's, it's his representation it's in his representational duties to to say things that may be viewed as contemptuous words against the president vice president secretary of defense or congress whether he he isn't able to do so even though his civilian counterparts would or whether he essentially is able to do, say and do the same things as as his civilian counterparts well with that backdrop of of, of colonel davis uh commenting to the press and then writing a memorandum to this super prosecutorial judicial authority that does it. I'm not going to try to explain who a convening authority is because it's, it's impossible to fully understand. It's kind of like the mayor, district attorney, all wrapped Congress, all wrapped up into one person. Uh, Colonel Davis sent this long email saying Dan has done all these horrible things and said all these horrible things that are a violation of, of Article 88. Dan filed a motion saying that. But he said that wasn't for him to say whether Dan would be prosecuted. Correct. No, he just pointed out that Dan has done these bad things. Uh, someone else should consider whether or not he should be prosecuted. But from the eyes of, of the, the issue being whether Dan is essentially chilled, Rule 1.7 of uh, the professional rules, I mean, all the military folks function under the, sort of the same rules that uh, procedural or professional responsibility rules that civilian attorneys function under. I mean, Rule 1.7 certainly would create a conflict if you're threatened with prosecution for doing what you believe is your job representing the guy. Does that, are you, are you, do you possibly have a conflict where you're not going to do as good a job representing your guy as you would have done in the past because you're saying these bad things and you're worried about saying these bad things? That really was the issue. Dan went down there with that motion essentially uh, on the horizon being, are we going to, are we going to, uh, they're going to do an arraignment, have him plead not guilty and raise the issue of Colonel Davis's prosecutorial misconduct, or at least the, uh, the statements that Colonel Davis said that Dan made and whether this is all good or bad. And at the last minute, uh, what happened down there was that before you even got to any of that stuff, um, the judge, he, Colonel, or uh, David Hicks is also represented by two civilians, Rebecca Snyder, a DOD employee who works in our office, but she's a civilian, Rebecca Snyder, and Josh Dreytel, a, a well-known criminal defense attorney, a civilian out of New York. And the first thing the judge did is he read, was going through the Military Commissions Act, and one of the rules or one of the, the procedures of the Military Commissions Act is that a guy can be represented by civilian counsel at no expense to the government. And he opined, probably correctly, that Rebecca Snyder, a DOD employee getting paid by the government out of our office, is a civilian employee at expense to the government. Therefore, she's disqualified. She can't play. She storms out of the courtroom. Now we have two guys. Then he turns to Josh Dreytel, the civilian, and elsewhere in the Military Commissions Act, there's a, proce a procedure where the Secretary of Defense is supposed to draft some rules that govern the conduct of civilian attorneys in this process and also draft some form that the civilian attorneys have to sign saying that they agree to follow the rules that have been drafted uh, so that they can represent the guy before this process. Well. Because Australia has been pressured so much to, uh, regarding the David Hicks case to get him back to Australia, the go our government decided to go ahead and go forward with the trial before there were any rules that govern the, the conduct of civilian lawyers and even the form that says that you've read the rules and you're going to comply with them. So the judge makes up his own little form but doesn't make up any of the rules. And in the form, it says, you, you need to sign this form, Mr. Draytel, and you, you have to agree to apply by professional responsibility rules that have yet been drafted. And Draytel says, are you kidding? I mean, how am I supposed to sign a form to agree to apply by rules I haven't seen that are being contemplated not by you but some other person somewhere? Uh, isn't that sort of putting the, car, the cart before the horse? And the judge said, if you won't sign the form, you don't represent him anymore, you're gone too. So they kicked Josh Dreytel out of the courtroom. And now you're down to one guy, the one guy who's threatened with, for, with criminal prosecution for doing his job, the only guy with the actual stinking, nasty conflict in this mess. 
and uh, they fought for a little bit about what to do with the lawyers because all the military commissions cases have come down to how do you manage the attorneys in this process. Um, there's been no substantive hearings on anything. It's just all how do you, what do you do with the lawyers? Who's the lawyer? Who's not the lawyer? Who, what can the lawyer do? What can't the lawyer do? It's really a mess. Um, so they kick off the two non-conflicted lawyers, keep the conflicted lawyer there, and Dan ends up pleading him guilty at the arraignment uh, without, a, without an agreement in place. So there was, there was an agree, without an agreement as to what sentence the guy would get. Usually when you negotiate a pretrial agreement and have your guy plead guilty, you negotiate the pretrial agreement and have your guy plead guilty, and you do it in those steps because if you have your guy plead guilty before you negotiate the pretrial agreement, it doesn't take much to realize that your negotiating power is a little bit reduced because your guy's already pled guilty and uh, your half of the bargain is gone. But they didn't do that there. They, he pled guilty without the agreement in place, it looks like. There's probably some wink and nod. I don't really know what completely happened yet. But the Australian. They're still down there. They're still down there. And he's going to be, they're bringing a jury down there now. And I think on, they're planning on Saturday having a, a sentencing hearing in the, the Hicks case. He pled guilty, bless you, he pled guilty to material support to a terrorist organization, faces somewhere between zero and life. That term of years is going to be negotiated after he pled guilty, apparently. And the good news out of all this, and this really shows what these guys are up against, both the detainees and the attorneys in Guantanamo Bay. I mean, Guantanamo Bay is so bad and so nasty that you do whatever you can do. Does, would David Hicks rather engage in the legal process that has been started and stopped for three years and with no real guarantee of what is ever going to happen in the future? but engage in the legal process, or would he like to plead to a crime which just is not a violation of the law of war, and if it's now a violation that can be tried by military commission, you have ex post facto problems, because it certainly wasn't back in 2001 when he committed the crime. Would you rather plead to the illegal charge at your arraignment with no idea what your sentence is going to be, but just know that you get to go back to Australia because your governments have at least negotiated that portion of it, that whatever sentence you do serve gets to go back into Australia. Would you rather plead to that crap and go back or take your chances and apparently the answer is you'll do whatever you can to get out of Guantanamo Bay, including pleading guilty at the arraignment without an agreement in place to a charge that doesn't exist before a tribunal that's arguably illegal um, in about three and a half days. So that's what's happened now, and it, and it sort of highlights, and, and Dan has done a great job, and I don't, certainly don't say anything, you know, the, the conflict issue is, is near and dear to my heart because I've, I've done a lot of the legal ethics stuff since I've been here, but it just... It just highlights what a broken mess Guantanamo Bay litigation is. And if, and if anybody here thinks these guys are going to get a fair trial uh, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, this really should, this is strong evidence that you're just not going to get one. You're going to have guys that are going to plead to crimes they didn't do. You're going to have guys that are going to waive everything they possibly can waive in order to get out of Gitmo. The big agreement, the big thing that we can do for defense, as a defense attorneys, it looks like, is to force our, the governments of the people that we're representing to do what the Australians did and at least agree to get your guy back to whatever country he's from after he's convicted. Because you'd rather serve your time on an illegal charge, I guess, and, and take your chances in Yemeni courts than you would sitting in Guantanamo Bay, whether, if, where you're convicted or acquitted, you still stay in Guantanamo Bay. Convicted as a person of, if you're convicted, you've been convicted of a war crime. If you're found not guilty, you're still held as an enemy combatant. So I think what I'll do is plead guilty even though I'm not a war criminal. Though I guess they just sort of forget about the enemy combatant stuff because then they're gonna send me back to my home country and at least I'm out of Guantanamo Bay. It truly is a mess and it's it, the next couple months, how they play out, uh, it, it's gonna be fascinating to watch. Wow. All right. uh, any, any I'll questions? hop off the pulpit now. <laughs> uh, any questions you guys have for? Uh, yeah. Um, this is for the, any or all of you um, who speak to the extent you can. Um, sounds like you know we have Canadian citizen in Canada. We have David Hicks, the Australian, um, and it sounds like there's some sort of bilateral agreement that was made for him to serve whatever sentence in Australia. And of course, as we all know with international law, assuming that they want to follow through with that, I guess. Um, but 
I'm curious as to, if, for those of us unfamiliar with international law, if you could speak as to the jurisdictional implications of a sentence that may be imposed by a military commission. Um, and for example, maybe not in the Hicks case or, or the communication of the other national lines are there, you know, as far as uh, other countries, full faith and credit, for lack of a better phrase, uh, of a sentence by a military commission. A state in agreeing to take a, a person in order to, for them to fulfill their sentence in this external state to which they would be transferred, can't waive the pre-existing rights that that person would have to approach the courts in that country. David Hicks has a habeas petition filed in Australia and certainly um, the Australian Foreign Ministry or any part of the Australian executive can't prevent David Hicks from pursuing his habeas rights in Australian courts, it, at least not if it gets, unless it gets parliamentary cooperation of a not unprecedented kind, but unusual kind in light of the MCA. Um, also, this is sort of goes somewhat beyond that to some extent, but because having had a conviction entered in his case at the military commission, he will then have had a final judgment in his case. He actually can at that point under the MCA get into US federal court and litigate the issue there. Why would he? Because if his conviction is overturned, then he gets out in Australia in that way. But what about like if a guy gets a 50-year sentence in Australia or in the military commissions, the Australians take him back, does he have to serve a 50-year sentence in Australia or can Australia say this is um, rubbish? I guess that's more British, but still. <laughs> uh, this is rubbish. This is a crazy trial. We're just going to throw this sentence away. A kangaroo court. Right. Oh. oh. So. So is there, is there, does, is, under international law, does, do states have to abide by other states' <coughs> judgments on like this kind of an issue? Not at all, not under international law, uh, except to the extent that they've made some agreement. Okay. Um, binding agreement to do that, but they can't make a binding agreement that would, I mean, domestically, presumably they can. They can do whatever they want right. and under international law, but presumably, um, if the uh, country in question is domestically ruled by law, they can't, the, the executive can't enter into an agreement with some external state to waive rights to go to court in your country. Okay. Any other questions? Is that it? I had a question about the charge that Hicks pled guilty to. The major said it was a, a made up charge or an illegal charge. I was wondering if the material support to a terrorist organization, if that's the, the federal criminal statute, section 2339, <laughs> that would apply to, I don't know, all Americans, or if it's, if it's what I remember in Military Commissions 2.0, if it's one of the charges the president just made up. Okay. Allison, Allison, do you want to reply? <laughs> um, Allison is sort of our ex post facto expert in the clinic. Not really. Um, <laughs> Basically, the, under the MCA and the way in which uh, the Manual for Military Commissions sets out that particular charge um, of material support, seems to incorporate both 18 U.S.C. 2339A and B, which is material support for terrorism and material support for terrorist organizations. They're seemingly substantially the same, except for punishment. Um, which would be an ex post facto violation. So at the time some of these crimes were committed, they carried with them a, a possible sentence of 10 years or 15 years. Um, and then later on they carried with them a sentence of life imprisonment. So to that extent, they violate ex post facto because they've changed the punishment, because the MCA has ret retroactively changed the punishment that could be imposed. Is the crime is the crime no good then, or can they? Is the punishment just have to be lower? Well, if it's a ten-year bill, 
Allison? Great. Actually, changed some of the elements as well. A and B have, have been amended twice since uh, September 11th, once in October of 2001 as part of the Patriot Act, and then again in 2004. <laughs> and I think in 01, there was actually a provision added that made, I think it was B, support to a terrorist organization. Yes. Yeah, so I think that was actually, that, that was not um, extraterritorially applied before that amendment in October of 01. So to the extent you're charging David Hicks with extraterritorial conduct that looks like what's described in 2339B before that date, there's, there's a, a definite ex post facto problem. So it's hard to paint a broad brushstroke with the material support for terrorism charge. Yes, that's going to be the government's argument. All we're doing is taking the same crime and making it tribal in different forum with different procedural protections, but that's not ex post facto. Uh, but I, I think there are some, some depending on the case and, and the exact statute you're dealing with, there are some issues as to whether or not there's actually an ex post facto uh, substantive offense. Even for any of the crimes identified in 113, Chapter 113B of the U.S. Criminal Code, which is the, the chapter dealing with terrorism, there are some overarching provisions in it that existed well prior to any of the crimes charged, which are not now being included, recognized, included as elements, whatever kinds of provisions they were um, that limited the applicability of all the crimes in that provision have been left out when those substantive crimes have been, by hypothesis, lifted and uh, put into the MCA for trial by military commission. So even at that, um, even pre-existing identified crimes, I would argue still because of the general provisions for the whole chapter uh, have ex post facto problems and other problems. Can you tell us what was, what was not carried over? Um, in fact, the, I was going to tell you about that just this afternoon and ask you what you think of it. So, um, one, certification by, yeah, the certif right, and I'm not sure I should right now. Let me come and ask you. I mean, these are, because then we're getting into litigation strategy issues. The other thing I was going to observe on the extraterritoriality, I wonder if 2339 wasn't whether it's true that it wasn't extraterritorial before the amendment or whether it was unclear whether it was extraterritorial because, as you know, under U.S. law, something doesn't have to expressly say that it's extraterritorial. Occasionally, provisions are found by their nature to appropriately be extraterritorial. Isn't there a presumption of, of non-extraterritoriality, though? But it can be overcome. So, for example, when a congressman who was on a fact-finding mission was killed, over, killed in Africa, court said, well, you know, actually, by its nature, this is supposed to follow the Congress people around anywhere. It wouldn't be too weird to think that terrorism involving these international entities, that, that it, by its nature, right, it might have been. <coughs> This is Professor Sarah Beale, who, as you can see, um, no, see needs go. desperately <laughs> to be recruited. You know. <laughs> and, you know, I, just, I don't think it said it wasn't extraterritorial. I think you were just relying on the presumption. It clarified so, it, so, yeah. Right. So you might have to engage in this this thought process, you know, kind of imaginary thought process about whether it could have been the to have been extraterritorial. Um, did he say if there is no ex post facto challenge? So assuming we, you can't make a challenge on that with Hicks, Hicks up uh, saying he's guilty under twenty three thirty nine. Has anyone said how 2339 even reaches him? And he didn't say he was guilty under 2339. He said material support, right? Which could be just general material, material support. Material support appears in the MCA. He pled under the MCA. Okay. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. And what, I mean, what they're doing right now and I, is they're spending a great deal of time in Guantanamo, his attorneys um, and the Australian attorneys as well, trying to negotiate the, uh, the exact provisions of the new material support uh, statute that he's alleged to have violated, that he's pleading guilty to, and what, exactly what acts he's alleged to have done, which would make him guilty of the particular statute. Because I think there's going to be a lot of questions uh, uh, still up in the air as regarding uh, exactly what he did, whether it was violent of the statute as it exists now or then, whether it would 
whether it would also cause maybe a different treatment in Australia rather than um, I mean, there's, now there's now you have concerns about how what he pleads to in America or this goofy military commission factually may have some may have some effect on how he's treated in Australia. Madeline? But well, the judge already took his plea yeah. conditionally. Ah, so, uh, okay. That's what they do. Yeah, and, and I say he took his plea conditionally. He, did, he he took his plea conditionally, and there was some indication that well, we're getting in the weeds. Um, Weeds are good. He can certainly back out of his guilt, out of his plea, any any time up until sentencing. Um, the problem with backing out of your plea now is that if he ever did want to testify, he would have the the uh, if he t in in military court, unlike federal court and most state courts, when you when you plead guilty, you have to give this fairly thorough. Uh, factual basis for your plea of guilty. You have to actually sign documents which say all the things that you did and the judge says, tell me why you're guilty. And it's not like you can just say, because I did it, I'm sorry I'm guilty. He'll want to engage you on all this, all the factual, uh, specific factual assertions. And that's what they're doing right now. He did a real broad, a broad brush, a broad, broad brush stroke, I'm guilty of this particular charge. The judge is going to keep it, take it all under advisement essentially. Uh, and will accept the plea after the whole thing is finally negotiated and after they have this, this probably fairly complicated plea colloquy um, where it discusses, discusses exactly what he is admitting to and what he's not admitting to. But I mean, this, this ex post facto stuff is going to be huge. Can you explain whether it actually is? Is there a written description now of the crime of material support? Mm -hmm. Right, and does it, does it track? Both 2330, I thought I heard both 2339A and E. That's, so it, it says yes, either, either did this or, or this. Exactly. It tracks quite, I think, closely enough that that's what they will attempt, uh, certainly, to compare it to. And it tracks fairly closely, but not identically. Um, well, it certainly adds, and it subtracts. And, it's always nice. Does it to have pick ads. up the definition of material support? Yes. yes. It cites directly to 2339. It, it picks up a. the post 2004 definition. Yes. Strangely okay. enough, also, it's the only um, charge, only crime listed in the MCA that does make reference back to 18 USC mm -hmm. and incorporate anything. You know, in terms of ex post facto, the 2004 amendments, I think, narrow the statute, they don't broaden it. Well, they, they add in the implementing legislation for, well, the 2002, 2002, as in the implementing legislation for suppress, uh, the, some of the conventions, um, suppression of terrorism and... Yeah, I was thinking of the definition of material support, which mm -hmm. I think narrows. Mm -hmm. And the mens rea narrows to 2339A and B, both, right? Uh, from... B, B. From its Requiring initial... You, well, who knows what it meant before. Mm -hmm. The Ninth Circuit thought that it meant in terms of what you have to know about the organization. There are also big issues about what dates the various acts were alleged to have occurred on and, and whether these are continuous, continuing crimes and you know all of the usual. But if, but if what the legislature does is make it better for you yes, because it in, increases so that government now has to have harder burden of proof on, on mens rea and a narrower definition of what are personnel and a narrower mm -hmm. definition of anything. Right? Yeah, we'll accept those. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for coming. There's uh, still probably some drinks and pizza y'all can grab on the way back. <laughs>